Okay, so let me give you some simple tips of things that you can do. So one of the things that I really want to point out, now I think we're getting away from this, the traditional standard instructional strategies a little bit, but still, we do a lot of lecture, and we have people read things, and we give them writing assignments. That tends to be the box that a lot of times we go into. What about adding a graphic organizer? You know, adding a way to take that same material and organize it in a visual graphic format, is that possible? What about some sort of creative activities the students might be able to do? What, what about a hands-on interactive activity that students might be able to do? Now, I know your instructional designers are always telling you, yeah, get something that's a little more interactive. How, how, do, we, how do we do that? Well, let me give you some examples. Now, these are mostly from face-to-face -face classes, but you could adapt many of these for online as well. So I had a person tell me that she had a history instructor, and she said, you know, this, she wasn't really excited about taking history, but this ended up being her best class of her entire college career. The instructor, the instructor started out putting tape down, and the whole class walked along this tape. And the instructor talked about, okay, so in this year, this kind of thing happened. And then over here, and this here, this happened. And scaled so that you could kind of get a sense of proportion about how long some of these things took and then how much they sped up as we go farther and farther. So the students literally walked the timeline. And then, as one of the activities in the course, the students had to choose a time period, and then they had to bring in something to class that would represent that time period. And they had a choice. They could do a paper. If they wanted to do a paper on that time period, that was fine. If they wanted to bring in art from that time period and do a presentation, music, poetry, whatever it might be. The idea was to bring in something that represented that time period and then to show that you understood what was happening in that time period that was causing you know, this whatever it was to be significant. Well, this person, she loved cosplay. You guys, I didn't know what that was. That's where you do the, the costume play, where you dress up in costume. I guess reenactment is kind of a cosplay thing. So she did this period-specific costume with all of the authentic detailing and all of that kind of stuff. And then she brought that into class, and she wore it, and she talked about, you know, because, I mean, if you're not aware, fashion is very much influenced by what's happening during the time period. Sometimes the fabrics that are available, sometimes the way fashion is viewed or what people have to do. I mean, these sorts of things. All is very significant in a historical perspective. She said that was the most engaging class that she ever took. She was so engaged in that class. Because it not only <laughs> was something she was learning about the information, but she was able to bring it into something she loved. And where we really learn is where we get to express our own creativity. So that's what we're talking about here, is how can you find a way for your students to express their own creativity? So English teacher, it was like a, a basic English class. They were learning about punctuation. Woohoo! <laughs> Sounds really exciting, right? It was amazing. So, what she did was she created specific criteria that she wanted the students to represent. They had to show the punctuation, what it looked like. They had to tell its name. They had to use it in a sentence and define it. How is it used? Beyond that, they could do it however they wanted to do it. One person, this would have been me, did a graph. <laughs> I love graphs and charts. You know, here is the punctuation symbol. Here is what it's called. Here is the sentence. You know, I've just lined it all up. Nice little chart. Boom, I'm done. That would have been me. But there were students. The most creative one was it was a little booklet that the person had used yarn to hook together. Every page was not, not just like typed out, but drawn. You know, here's the semicolon drawn in calligraphy, and the sentence very beautifully written out, and the whole thing in this little booklet, and every page was a different punctuation symbol. Those were kind of the, the two extremes, but there's everything in between. So not only were students expressing what they learned, but they were doing it in a way that also expressed themselves. And that's so important for a lot of our students, to really be able to have that self-expression. And it's a way to think about it. Think about, well, what do I actually want here? What do I want students to demonstrate? And then give them some flexibility about how they demonstrate that. This is one of the pivotal underlying points of universal design for learning, is giving that flexibility, build, building in that flexibility. And then people have said to me, well, I'm not I'm comfortable with lecturing. <laughs> 
you know, I can do a PowerPoint, but I don't really, you know, a graphic organizer? I, I, I just don't even know how I would do something like that. Well, make it an extra credit activity for your students. Come up with a way to demonstrate this in a different way. And then if somebody comes up with something really good, then you can say to the student, wow, you know, this is, I really like this. Would you mind if I use this example with my class next semester? I mean, how is that going to make your students feel? It's like, wow, my instructor is really noticing what I did and giving me kudos for really doing a great job here. I mean, yay, yay student. <laughs> so it really is all about inclusion. And like I said, you, we can never really say, well, a student who's blind is never going to. A student who is deaf is never going to. So there are ways to work with students with disabilities. I know of a student who was totally blind who took art history. Now, you can imagine the instructor teaching that class kind of freaked out when she found out that you know she had a student who was totally blind taking art history. But this is where she sat down with disability services. They really talked about, OK, what are the learning outcomes here? Now, fortunately, in this particular class, it was not about you have to look at this painting and know who painted it. It wasn't that sort of thing. It was more we had to know about the time period and the influences and the major artists of the time and what they were doing and that sort of thing. So they were able to do that in other ways. They used a lot of tactile graphics. They used a lot of 3D models, and that was disability services working with the instructor on that. And what the instructor found was that, funny thing, Lots of other students like the 3D models. Lots of other students like the tactile graphics. She said it changed the whole way she taught. She made it much more interactive, much more hands-on, much more just, you know, not just presenting the PowerPoint slides to the entire auditorium, but really engaging the students in a different way. There was an instructor who had a student who was blind in her class, in a biology class. And so she thought about this, wow, a lot of things in biology that are going to be kind of hard for the student to understand. But she was one of the craft type people, and so she went down to her, what do you have here, Hobby Lobby or, yeah, okay. And she got a crazy foam, I think that's what you call it, where you can cut out the foam, it's sort of this, you know, and then you can glue it together. So um, one of the basic animals that you learn about in beginning biology is a planaria, a flatworm. Some of you might remember the flatworm, you know, the guy. <laughs> And it, it, it responds to certain things, and so it's a lot about learning about stimuli and things like that. So she, you know, cut it out out of gray foam stuff, and, and then she put a, for the feeding tube, which is in its belly, she used a straw, so that made sense, and she got the crazy eyes and put them on the top, and, and then she was able to sort of, you know, because it was two layers, pull it apart to show, you know, and then after it eats, it plumps up, you know, because <laughs> all the food sort of like, well, a lot of that happens to us too, right? <laughs> Thanksgiving. In the big. And, and then uh, the one that I thought was incredibly clever is there's something in, um, in basic science called the sodium potassium pump. And it's about, you know, how these molecules move across the cell membrane. So she actually used, she made a little cell membrane. She used little flywheels. Um, and then she had different size marbles for the potassium and the sodium. So she could show how this one passed right through. But this other one could only go through where the flywheels were because it took extra energy to do it. And I thought, oh my God, I would have so much understood that concept better <laughs> if I had had a teacher like this. Well, what she found is, so she put the student up front next to her because she was passing the student, you know, these manipulatives the whole class. Slowly, the entire class migrated to that front corner because students always sit in the front row, right? <laughs> yeah, the whole class came down. And she found, again, it improved and changed her way of teaching so that all of her students had a better learning experience. And then, I was working, the, I got into this field because my roommate in college was blind. And we took a statistics course together. And in the statistics course, I thought that our instructor was brilliant. He said, you know, you can hear, you can hear a bell curve. He said, think about popcorn popping. Think about it. It's a bell curve. So it's creative. 
when you're looking at how to, how to include all of your learners, how to increase their learning, how to increase their engagement, honestly, it's going to increase your learning and engagement, too. Because you will need to start thinking in a way of, of your subject that's more creative. So I'm going to give you some specific tips for specific disabilities. If you have a student who has hearing issues, be really aware of visual po positioning. So what do I mean by that? Many individuals who have hearing loss are aided by being able to see you, to being able to see your lips, their reading lips. By the way, we all do this. I don't know if you're aware of this, but we all do it to a certain extent. We're all reading people's facial expressions to get more information about what's going on. Helps your students for whom English is not their first language as well. The other thing is be aware of where the interpreter is. If you've got the interpreter on one side of your classroom and your screen with your PowerPoint coming up on the other side of your classroom, think about this poor student. They're looking at you know, the screen, they're looking at their interpreter, they're looking at the screen, they're looking at the interpreter, they're looking at the screen, looking. They're doing this huge amount of having to go back and forth. And all of this takes a lot of time and adds a lot to the cognitive load. So the more that things can kind of be in one place where it's really easy to see, it's really helpful. Build in pauses. It takes a while to do all that looking around. So it's really helpful for students who are deaf who are building in pauses. And if you are using PowerPoint, think about if you can give it to them ahead of time. So then they can read through that. So in class, they can actually watch you and the interpreter more than having to read every word on the PowerPoint slide. Um, pointing. Using gestures, drawing, anything that makes it really clear, this is where we are, this is what we're talking about, this is what we're looking at. Don't be like a, a calculus instructor I had. Th this was, I'm not kidding, this is how he taught. Right, 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 right. Any questions? No. Erase, 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 right. It's like, fortunately the view was not bad. <laughs> But it was very frustrating. I, I you know, found some of those old notes a while back. It's like I'd have half the equation written down. I, I couldn't even Because <laughs> he was blocking half of it with his body. It's like, really? Yeah, so that, that all is really helpful. And then, of course, captions. And captions, again, are one of those universal design elements that it really helps so many of us. I actually, OK, here's a little known fact. My college major was zoology. Yeah. Remember, I had a roommate who was blind. That's how I ended up in this field, because when I got out of college, there were no jobs in my majors. But there was one for working with somebody who was blind and visually impaired. It's like, OK, I can do that. I know how to do that. So you know, all those extracurricular things, you never know. Some of those can become your career. Um, so that um, I actually dropped. I, I, the first time I started to take zoology, I had not had biology in high school. And it was supposed to be a review on the first day, and the instructor started talking about this odd thing called osmosis, which I'd never heard of before, and I couldn't even look up because I didn't know how it was spelled. So the, and I dropped that class, and I, I eventually came back and um, tried again. But seeing and hearing at the same time, and especially, think about all of those STEM subjects, all of that terminology. Oh my gosh, this helps so much. Australopithecus, Australia what? If you don't know, you don't know. Vision issues, this is where, and I've talked a little bit about this, train yourself to use concrete terms. Just get rid of this, that, here, there, and the dreaded thing. We often, and I, I so often hear instructors say this, you can see that, well maybe, maybe I can, maybe I can't. What am I supposed to be seeing? Tell me what I'm supposed to be seeing. Verbalize it for me. And sometimes we even think we're saying something and we're not. Set both factors equal to zero and solve. That almost sounds like there's some content there, but I, what, what equation? What factors? What, you know, what are we talking about? Just get used to verbalizing it. And it does take some training in the beginning. It really does, because it's not intuitive. It's much more intuitive to say thing, you know, do that thing. But it will help all of your students. And then. One of the huge reasons that we want to provide a good, accessible document is so that your students can actually hear that document. And again, added value and universal design, there's free tools out there that any of your students can use to make an MP3 file 
And if you've got students who are commuting, then they can listen to whatever that assigned reading was and not just have to wait until they're doing other things. Or if they have, and many students do, have a student job where it's doing something where they can actually listen to their iPods or whatever at the same time, then they can be listening to their classwork instead of just their music. For your hands-on learners, this is, there's some people who are like this. These are your folks who say, you know, as soon as I do it myself, I know it. I, I, these are the people you need to walk them through the steps. Literally, walk them through the steps. What are the steps? Actually go through it. Don't expect them just to read it and get it. Just walk through, give examples. Um, gestures are also really good for this group. And then these are the folks who really respond well to that activity-based homework. That really will bring home the point to them. And then, of course, the more modalities that you can get and design for, the better. Because then you're really opening it up. So you're not just designing for students with disabilities. You're really designing for all students who maybe are better at listening or better at seeing something or better at doing something hands-on. Needed absolutely by some students, but useful in a lot of ways for so many of us. And then I want to talk just for a minute about assessment. I have to say, you know, what are we really testing? I really wonder that sometimes. So I have a friend. Uh, she was a biology major. I was a zoology major. We've been friends since college. She'd had uh, been in an automobile accident shortly before college started and had a head injury. And if you've ever interacted with someone who's had a head injury, you know that it can impact your thinking because you've damaged your brain. I mean, it's just like if you get a sprained wrist, it's going to damage what you can or impede what you can do with your, your hands. So she really struggled. Her short-term memory was not good. I, kind of relate to this, some of you as you're getting older. <laughs> Plus I'm jet lagged, so. <laughs> yeah, I was telling Teresa this morning, yeah, I, can, I literally, my short term memory is like gone right now. Um, but in college it was fabulous. I had fabulous memory in college, which was why I could be a zoology major. So we would both study for the same test. I would get an A, she would get a C. But we were having a discussion the other night, and she said, oh, that particular dopamine, that's in the, I think it's the Sciuris nigra area of the brain. And I'm thinking, oh. she took that class 40 years ago, and she still remembers. I had to look it up on Google. <laughs> so what are we really testing with the way that we're testing? I mean, who did better in that class? I was the one who got an A, but I would argue that in terms of memory and retention, she probably was the one who actually did better over time. So it's something to think about. This is not anything that I have a huge answer for or that you can solve. But you know, one of the things about um, time restraints is, or time constraints rather, are they really necessary? If you look at research, you're going to find that there's not a whole lot of valid research saying that time restrictions are any sort of a valid measurement when it comes to assessment. You can you know, look up the studies on that. But you have a lot of students out there that have huge anxiety. In fact, talking with folks in disability services, they're seeing this huge spike in incoming freshmen who have so much test anxiety that they literally just freeze. And they literally are not able to test. And I don't know, hopefully it's not as bad for you guys, but I was teaching in Silicon Valley. And the pressure there is so huge. I mean, it's just, it's enormous. I mean, it's like their whole lives hinge on this one test, and they're just going crazy. So it's something to think about. And are there any real world parallels that you can use in your discipline where maybe you can do a different kind of assessment? So I want to give you an example of somebody who really looked, looked in depth at this issue and said, you know, I want to, I want to do it differently. Uh, he teaches legal classes at uh, UC Berkeley Hastings College of Law. So we're not talking about, you know, Grenada here. We're talking about somebody doing mainstream stuff. He makes all of his tests take home an open book, all of them. The students are allowed a week. And they're limited by a word count. So they're not able to just go on and on like some of the people who just say, oh, my major was so easy. I could just BS my way through. It's like, really? I was a zoology major. <laughs> you, well, there is some, but it's a different kind of a thing. So, so my friend looked at it and said, well, you know, I was looking for real world parallels. He said, I gave him a week because lawyers do have to work under some time constraints, but they're not expected as lawyers to come up with instant solutions. That is not how the law works. 
He said it's open book because we also, lawyers are always expected to have reference to know how to use their references. And he said that became, for him, a major part of his assessment. Can you use the references? Can you really do that? And he said there is a word limit because apparently they're called briefs for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't quite sure about that one. But I think it also was because you know, he wanted people to be succinct. And yeah. It's harder, right? You guys know this. It's harder to write 500 words than it is to write 2,000 words because you've got to really hone it down and narrow it down. And he said he's hardly ever asked for accommodations because he has so much access already built in that it meets the needs of the vast majority of students and not just individuals with disabilities, but it also meets the needs of working parents, people who, well, gosh, you think you're being really gracious by handing it out on Friday and making it due on Monday. But you may have students who, you know, they go to school all week and then they put in a 40-hour weekend so that they can support their families. So it really worked really well. So something to think about. And how am I doing? I've got another 20 minutes here. And I, I know you're going to start cutting me off here. I can see you have the hook over there. <laughs> but I'm just going to say a little bit here about giving you a little bit more specifics about creating accessible materials. So any materials you're uploading into Canvas that you're uploading onto your website or your web page need to be accessible before you upload them. So these are like the Word documents, the PowerPoints, the, the videos. They're not going to get better once you <laughs> stick them in there. So they need to be accessible first. Um, and everything that you're putting online does need to be accessible, including your PDFs, your PowerPoints, your videos, if you're using software and apps. So the easy button, because I'm all about the easy button. I actually had somebody say that about me. I overheard this, and he was like, oh, yeah, Geyer, she's all about the easy button. I wasn't actually sure if he was complimenting me or not. But, <laughs> but I thought of it as a compliment, because it's like, yes, if I make it easy, you'll do it. Why would you not do it if it's easy? You have this wonderful thing in Canvas called the Rich Content Editor. It has great tools. It's that little tiny bar sitting up there. If you haven't explored it, there's all kinds of cool stuff in there. Use those tools if you're going to build it in Canvas. And by the way, um, I, I hope I'm not saying something you guys don't agree with. Our preference, at least in my system, is build it in Canvas rather than uploading those Word and PowerPoint. Yeah, OK. Why? It's cross-platform. You don't have to have Microsoft products in order to open it. You've already got Canvas. They have the Canvas interface. It will scale. They can use it on their iPhone. They can use it on their Android. They can use it on their tablet, on their computer. It doesn't matter. It will work on all of them if you build it inside the, the interface. So I'm going to give you a simple list to follow. So listen up. This is what you need to do to make your documents or any text accessible. L-I-S-T. You're just going to follow this four-step list. L is for links. That is your hyperlinks. Name your hyperlinks in a logical way. So in other words, not click here. Yeah. Tell me what I'm going to get when I click. Section 508 standards, grading syllabus or grading um, requirements for whatever the course is. Use that. Now if you still need to say click, go ahead and say you know, syllabus for you know, biology 10A, click here. That's fine, but we want what it is first. Why? Because people who are using a screen reader are going to go from link to link to link. They're not going to hear that surrounding text. And if they're all click here, they're going to hear click here, click here, click here. Oh, wow, that was really helpful. <laughs> not. So just need, give it a logical link name if you're using hyperlinks. Images, we talked about this a little bit. I is for images. That's where you're putting that alternate text label. And it is just a label, honestly. Not a big, long description. Just a label. What is this? You know. Um, Scatter plot for blah, 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 whatever it might be. Uh, structure. Now, S is for structure. This is going to vary depending on the program because the structure of the program themselves varies a little bit. In Word, what it means is use your headings. Canvas also use your headings. Use your bullets so that you've got some structure there. And then tables. Mark the header row and the first column if you have that first column as a header in your tables. By the way, your accessibility checker tool in Canvas will let you mark the table so easily. When you run the accessibility checker, literally, it's going to say, oh, I see a table. 
Is the first row a header? You just check yes. Oh, is the first column a header? Yes. Boom, you're done. You have now made an accessible table. Woohoo! It's so, so easy. Um, caption your videos. We talked about that already. And then watch out for your use of color. If you are using color, if you like on PowerPoint, for instance, there um, is a great free tool, and I'm not sure I gave you a link to this actually. It's called the Color Contrast Analyzer. If you just Google Color Contrast Analyzer, you'll find it. It's a nice little piece of software. It sits on your desktop, has a little eyedropper. You take an eyedropper of foreground color, take an eyedropper of background color, and it will say yes or no. Good enough contrast, not good enough contrast. Do it on your PowerPoints, please. <laughs> Seriously, yellow text on a white background is one of my absolute pet peeves. It's like, really? Maybe it looked good from two and a half feet away, but trust me, from 20 feet away, you can't read it. The other thing with color is you don't want to use color by itself to convey information. So if in my document all of my vocabulary words are in red and all the terms that are going to be on the crest test are in green and I have red-green color blindness, I'm in trouble because I literally cannot <laughs> distinguish between those two colors. So what do you do? You combine color with something else. All of my vocabulary words are red and bold. All of the ones that are on the test are green and italic. Then even if I can't see the color, I can see the bold, I can see the italic, we're good. I don't want to discourage you from using color. Color is super helpful for a lot of people. Just combine it with something else. A good rule of thumb is try printing out anything you, you use color on in black and white and see, does it still make sense? Is it still easy to understand? If not, yeah, it's probably a problem. Uh, learning can, I, so can I interrupt? Yes. Because some people will have to go to class, and okay. it would be nice for one or two questions, just if anybody's sitting here thinking, I have a question. I'm facing a situation. Another thing, an interactive part, these are small <coughs> trash cans. So while going, would you fold this up a little or take the box with you? Because we, we get in trouble with the maintenance people. <laughs> <laughs> if there are no questions, of course. You I, can, I can keep going? You. Yeah, of okay. course. Yeah. Okay, so um, I do want to actually answer the question that some of you might be thinking that that you have not asked, which is, if I have something that's not accessible, can I use it anyway? Um, if, as long as we're not talking about something like a video, videos do need to be captioned, but if you're talking about learning software, something like that, if you make it a true option, one of many options, not just you don't have to, you poor person with a disability, that's not an option, that's <laughs> taking away options, that's taking away choice, we're not talking about that. But, you know, okay, great, some students, although frankly not as many as you might think, do like some of that learning software. Great, make it available, but don't require it. Make it a true option. No one has to use it. And then that is good for also your students who just don't really like technology. There are a few of those out there. They're just not really fond of technology. They don't really want to use that stuff. It's okay for them, it's okay for a student with disability. Everybody it's okay for, but there are things that you can do as well. And then, um, I already talked about the student learning outcomes, so I can skip that. People will say to me, what does it mean? Nobody tells me what it means to be accessible. Well, I just gave you the list. That's, that's really what it means. But if you want the really, truly official guidance, it is WCAG 2.0 level AA. Let me define that. Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. It's available from the W3C. That is the three W's we type every day, www. World Wide Web. The World Wide Web Consortium, they are the people who make the web go. They're the ones who come up with the rules about what is HTML5 and how does it work. So they have lots of information. If you go to w3.org, go to their website, lots of great information there. But I'm going to warn you, it is very detailed, it is very nerdy, and unless you're pretty technical, you're probably going to go, I, yeah, no. Because <laughs> it's, not, it's not easy. But that is where it is. And I know that there's some people, and more power to you, who are like, I want to see where it's written. I want the primary source. That's good. I mean, honestly, we could use a little more of that now, I think, frankly. But that is where the primary source is, in w3.org. Now, Obviously, this is not going to instantly happen overnight. So what do we do in the meantime? So what I encourage people to do is add a little disclaimer in your syllabus on your course, uh, on your, your web page, if you have a web page. 
saying if you're an individual with a disability and require greater access for any document, video, whatever it might be on this site, please contact and then have your contact information. So remember, accommodation is always the backup plan to access. When access falls short, make it easy for people to get the accommodation that they need. Now, you're not going to be expected to have it done overnight, but just respond. <coughs> and your response may also include, oh my gosh, I'm going to call DSS and find out, you know what, and that's fine. But realize that if you're answering somebody's question, if you're addressing their need, they're going to feel a lot better about the process, which is just going to save you and the campus a huge amount of, of hurt. So, no questions? And we come up with one? Oh, good. I love questions, by the way. I have a, a question for you that relates more to Canvas. Uh -huh. Whether or not there's a configuration in Canvas that you find to be more accessible. Based on what I'm hearing you say in this discussion, I'm guessing the um, use of a home page that links you to other pages where there's content already written out, etc., is more accessible than having something that is module based where it's many times multiple files that are uploaded. I would agree with that 100% and not just from a disability perspective. I'm taking an online course now. Oh my gosh. I mean, I, I, and it's in Canvas. And honestly, I did not expect it to be as confusing as it was. I mean, I'm a techie. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. So I've got to go to this module thing, but then I have to go to next. And then I keep going to next. And then it says to watch a video. And there's some in videos embedded only, gosh, I also have to follow these other links to this. Yeah, I would, re you know, give me week one. Week two, and then let me go someplace, and everything I need for week one is there. And I still am trying to sort out exactly everything that I need to do because it's in, like you said, it's in all of these different places. I find that confusing. I would imagine if you're setting your course up that way, don't you get a lot of questions from students about, no, you know, oh man, well, maybe it's just me then. But, but, no, but it, it does go back to what you said before about having there be cross-platform um, accessibility, and I'm guessing the screen reader accessibility is a little bit easier on something that's a digital page like Canvas as opposed to a flat article. I mean, all those kinds of things play into it. Um, but yeah. I, unfortunately, that's not the, the default setting in Canvas. In Canvas, so, yeah. So it's an extra many steps for faculty. That's too bad. But you know, no, I'm saying it's, just, it's unfortunate that they don't have it configured with a home page and let us do it that way. But that is also maybe something, I mean, if people are interested in it, that that could be a template that your instructional designers could set up for you. And so, and I know that's something that's on discussion. In fact, I was supposed to ask that question, wasn't I? Um, so for those of you who are using Canvas and teaching online, would templates be useful to you? Yeah, because we have to do a request now to get up on page okay. at it each time. Okay, I'm seeing quite a few nods here, okay. so, That's yeah. Yeah, it was really ma just a matter of they weren't sure if it was going to be useful to you or not. Yeah, 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 for sure. It okay. Would, would, I think it would help to know what that looked like, because we transitioned, we created our stuff from Blackboard, so there was that. So you talked about retrofitting. Being more yeah, we had big retrofit. Big retrofit, that just happened. Yeah. 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 Still on the but a good time to add in those accessibility things. Absolutely. So, well, yeah, a couple specifics with Canvas. If you're doing a Canvas page, the, pl the place where you put your title in the page, that's automatically a heading one. It does that for you. If you want to use other headings and you want to use a bulleted list, that's in your rich content editor under paragraphs. Um, in your, if you're embedding an image, it's going to give you your little embed image icon. You put your image in. Right there, it gives you the opportunity to put your alternate text label on it right there. It also has a checkbox for decorative. You use one or the other, not both. So the preference for, if you read what the National Federation of the Blind says about alternate text labels, unless there's something you expect them to actually do or get out of that graphic, mark it decorative. They would just as soon not know about it. So that makes it really easy. You check that box, you're done. You don't even have to write anything in there. Uh, tables, I would wait until you actually are running your accessibility checker. Don't even bother marking them until you do the accessibility checker, because it's so easy with the accessibility checker. And then um, 
And yep. that is a button on the Rich Content Editor, in case you haven't noticed. Haven't it. found that one. It's great. The accessibility checker is really, really nice. And if you're working on an older course that the graphics are already in there, it's a little bit non-intuitive. You still click on the graphic and go to Embed Image, even though it's like, well, my image is already there. I don't have to embed it. It's already. But that's just the way they do it. There's a couple of slightly funky things like that in Canvas. The wording is a couple places a little bit funky, but that's real easy. And then your hyperlinks, you have a hyperlink button on your, your rich content editor up there. So you can sit, do that same LIST in Canvas. One other follow-up, you mentioned um, using uh, the apps or software to convert text to podcast. Do you have a preferred app or something? Uh, well, the one that I often recommend just because it's free and easy and also does math is called Central Access Reader. Central Access Reader, and it's central because it came out of Central Washington University. But Central Access Reader is free. It will take take a doc, I think a doc or a doc X. It has to be has to be in a, a doc or a doc X. But if you have used math type to set up math equations in it, you're not doing math, so you're not worried about that. Uh, it will literally read the math. It will verbalize the math. So for STEM instructors, that's kind of cool because there's not much that verbalizes math. But I like that just because it's easy. It's really an easy button and it's free. 